The Coronavirus Files, Part 2. Today, Taiwan Envy, how they dealt with the coronavirus. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the latest posts covering finance and property news. And I'm joined again by Salvatore Babanes, Associate Professor at the University of Sydney. And uh, Salvatore, we're having a bit of a conversation about coronavirus, and this particular angle I think is really important. Oh, well, Taiwan has had 5% of the case count of Australia. If you think Australia has been a coronavirus success, Look to Taiwan, uh, not only a much smaller case count, but of course, uh, an almost completely open economy. Uh, they have had, they've successfully fought the coronavirus at the border instead of having to fight it in the community. That's the real lesson we should be learning from Taiwan. Right. And uh, in your earlier post, you made the point that we were late to closing our borders. And as a result of that, you know, we had 12 weeks of hell. Um, they avoided it. Well, they avoided it because they took border security seriously. All the commentators who are talking about Taiwan's success with coronavirus seem to be focused on you know, the fact that Taiwan had secret inside information in China. They had access to the best knowledge. Some have been pointing to the preparations they made after the 2003-2004 SARS epidemic that, well, they've experienced an epidemic before, so they've put preparations in place. Both of those explanations are completely false. I mean, first, let's talk about the advanced knowledge they supposedly had. That advanced knowledge amounted to one day. <laughs> that is December 30th. On December 30th, 2019, there was a published report in Chinese about a pneumonia in Wuhan. Taiwan immediately put in place uh, public health measures for passengers arriving from Wuhan. That got into English and reached Australia on December 31st, at which point New South Wales and Victoria put in uh, screening for passengers from Taiwan. Not screening at the border, but screening at hospitals. Okay, so Australia's coronavirus, coronavirus response was delayed one day by the fact that Australia spoke English and Taiwan spoke Chinese. No big deal. Uh, if we then talk about its preparation in response to SARS, what SARS did in 2003, 2004 was expose the problems with Taiwan's epidemic response that were already reflected in the kind of preparations that countries like Australia and the United States had. For example, before 2003, Taiwan did not have a national uh, infectious disease monitoring system. They put that in place in 2004. Well, Australia has had an epidemic monitoring system for decades, right? So all Taiwan did was catch up to where we are about monitoring infectious disease. So before the SARS epidemic, if there was an infectious disease case at a hospital in Taiwan, it was dealt with in the hospital. They didn't report it up. There was no infrastructure to handle that. Australia has all that infrastructure. So again, it's not a matter of Taiwan becoming somehow magically better because it had this trial by fire with SARS. Instead, the big difference between Taiwan's coronavirus response and ours was how it handled border security. <laughs> make you make it sound so simple. It is so simple. Uh, Taiwan did things like temperature screening of passengers at airports. Now, there's some debate over whether temperature screening is really effective. It doesn't capture any everyone. Many people are asymptomatic, but it catches some, right? It's always a matter of can you catch some? Can you reduce? The exposure. A lot of public health experts were saying we should not have travel bans because somebody will always find a way to get into the country. Well, you know what? We can handle one person getting into the country. There's a big difference between having 100,000 students arrive from China in February, which is what we would have had had we not had travel restrictions, and a few students finding their way around those restrictions. Uh, what Taiwan did was implement tight restrictions at each point to catch as many as it could. Now, that started with simple temperature screening, but that soon escalated to quarantining arriving passengers, first from Wuhan, then from all of China, then from cruise ships. So Taiwan at each stage implemented 
hard border measures. I mean, when I say quarantine is a border measure, I mean the border in depth. The border isn't just that checkpoint at the airport. It's what happens when the person enters the country. So Australia and Taiwan both had public health officers greeting passengers arriving from Wuhan in January. In Australia, they were handed a flyer. (laughs) <laughs> that said, here's what you should do to self-isolate at home, wash your hands, be careful. In Taiwan, they were put under quarantine, meaning they weren't allowed to leave their house. They were handed an electronic monitoring device, actually a specially modified mobile phone that had GPS turned on and the person couldn't turn it off. They had to carry this phone everywhere they went. If they left the home and they were caught without their phone, they were fined several thousand dollars. It was a Not exactly a hard quarantine China style with police officers outside your door, but it was a monitored quarantine, a very strict quarantine where people knew it meant business. No one in Taiwan was coming home from overseas with coronavirus, as a couple in Australia did from Colorado's fee vacation, and then going golfing uh, because in Taiwan they took that quarantine seriously. Now, that was back in January for patients from Wuhan in February from arrivals from China. Taiwan, in fact, was later than Australia in closing the border with China. They did it five days after we did, because the issue was not just closing the border. The issue was how tight, how sealed the border is. Uh, Taiwan, a, you know, an island of 24 million people just off the coast of China, where something like one to two million people in Taiwan are actually living in the People's Republic of China, they couldn't just put up a wall like we could. You know, they really had to have a flexible border, but a strong border. So they were quarantining people while we were handing out leaflets. <laughs> and so their numbers are way down relative to ours. I mean, ours aren't too bad, but they're, they're a lot better. And uh, essentially, they've been able to carry on very much as normal. Well, 80% of Taiwan's coronavirus cases have been returning travelers. That means very few people have actually caught coronavirus in Taiwan. And those few who have, have mainly been caregivers, people who are, you know, have a husband or wife coming home with coronavirus and it, it spreads to the caregiver. They don't have transmission through the health system. They don't have transmission into the general population because returning travelers by February, returning travelers, whether they had symptoms or not, were being put in quarantine if they were coming from highly infected areas. And here's a lesson Australia needs to learn. Australia put this big wall up with China February 1st and then did nothing. In fact, consistently loosened its restrictions throughout February, allowing international students in, telling students, if you go to Thailand for two weeks, you can come into Australia. If you go to Dubai for two weeks, you can come into Australia. We had, throughout February, we lost a month. We lost four weeks of potential coronavirus response. In Taiwan, they continuously ratcheted up the restrictions so that first it was Italy, then it was South Korea, then country after country. As coronavirus broke out in that country, foreigners from that place couldn't enter Taiwan, and Taiwanese entering had to go into quarantine. Didn't matter whether you had symptoms or not. If you're coming from a place where the coronavirus was endemic, you had to go into two weeks quarantine in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And that progressive ratcheting up not only kept the virus out, it meant that when Taiwan put restrictions on all travelers, just as Australia did, I mean, pretty much the whole world uh, locked down travel after March 20th, Taiwan was already prepared with a quarantine system that had been tested little by little, first on passengers from Wuhan, then from China, then from other countries. So the quarantine system was up, running, and effective by the time the global travel ban went into place. In Australia, when it put in its quarantine system in late March, it was pandemonium at the airports. I mean, you remember the famous case of the doctors coming from the coronavirus infected cruise ship off the coast of uh, Argentina, uh, missed quarantine and flew home to their destinations. Uh, Nothing like that happened in Taiwan because by the time they had the massive global travel ban, they had already had something like 10 weeks practice in implementing monitored quarantines. So as a case study, it really is an object lesson, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, look at the cruise ships. Uh, Taiwan, 
uh, had the same kind of cruise ship problems Australia did. In fact, the Diamond Princess, <laughs> the cruise ship caught off Yokohama, had been sailing in Taiwan's waters. Now, it didn't stop in Taiwan, but another cruise ship that went from Taiwan to Yokohama was suspected of having coronavirus patients on it. They recalled it back to Taiwan. Taiwan put in a cruise ship ban on February 6th. Now, that's four weeks before our own Ruby Princess even set sail. And when this cruise ship returned from Japan, although Taiwan had a cruise ship ban, they had everyone quarantined on the ship, everyone tested for coronavirus before they were allowed out into the community. Now, this is a whole month before, more than a month before, our own Ruby Princess fiasco. Taiwan was already treating all returning cruise ships as potential sources of coronavirus, whether they had reported infections or not. Now, it turned out that this re returning ship trip did not have returning, it did not have uh, infections among its passengers, but it could have, right? And because it could have, it was quarantined. No other cruise ships were allowed to leave or return to Taiwan after February 6th. That's before, that's way before we even thought about implementing cruise ship restrictions. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we could have learned probably quite a lot then. And uh, I wonder what this says about but, the... Go on. Oh, but no, I, I don't think we could have learned from Taiwan. I think in okay. retrospect, we can learn from Taiwan. Hmm. At the time, there was no need to be copying what Taiwan was doing. At the time, all we had to do was show good common sense. I mean, I have a friend who went on a cruise in March and all of us said, you're crazy. How can you go on a cruise? There's coronavirus on cruise ships. And her answer was, well, we paid for this cruise six months ago and the cruise companies are not offering refunds. So we feel we kind of have to go. You know, it was a cruise of a lifetime. It was fantastic. Uh, and she got home safe and, and you know, ultimately not a problem. But all of us knew, I mean, all of us who thought about it, thought, are you serious? You're going on a cruise when the Diamond Princess is docked in Yokohama with 700 coronavirus patients? Um, it's the government did nothing about it that's the problem. Any reasonable person would have said, you know, there's a coronavirus hotspot in northern Italy. People shouldn't be traveling to Australia from northern Italy. You know, every reasonable person would have said once coronavirus was circulating wildly in South Korea, we probably shouldn't have people coming from South Korea, from Iran. I mean, all of these travel restrictions Taiwan put in place weeks before Australia did, because as soon as the coronavirus became endemic in a particular country or region, Taiwan slapped a travel restriction on that region and crucially quarantined even its own citizens returning from that region. Now, that to me is plain common sense. I think any ordinary person asked in early March, is it a good idea to take a cruise? <laughs> would have said no. Now, all Taiwan did was implement common sense in its border security. We could have done the same. Mm. And sometimes common sense is all you need, isn't it? Well, common sense is in short supply. Now, it may be because Taiwan was not a member of the World Health Organization. <laughs> Your listeners may be aware uh, Taiwan has been excluded from uh, most intergovernmental organizations because of pressure from China, which you know, views Taiwan as a province of China and refuses to allow China to join organizations like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, you know, and the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, beholden to China, was repeatedly advising travel is fine, travel restrictions are useless, Countries should not restrict travel. Taiwan, not being a member of the WHO, completely ignored that advice. Mm. We well, followed it. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe we should have a separate conversation then about WHO. Uh, I have a lot to tell you about WHO. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do that as a separate conversation because uh, I think there are some very important questions which need to be asked there. And, uh, you know, once again, uh, thank you so much for your insights and your, um, you know, precision in terms of pointing out what the uh, truth is. I think it's important that this uh, is uh, um, highlighted because there are some very important lessons there. Well, thank you, Martin. I'll direct people to the Center for Independent Studies, which sponsored this research, and the paper, the full paper, is available on the website of the CIS. Thanks for your time. We'll talk next time. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>